Welcome back. This week, I'm not joined by Welsh Chris. I'm joined by a different Chris, German Chris. That would be our friend Chris from Cheyenne. He was over for a few days just before he set out to go to the Calgary show. And I managed to sit him down and have a chat with him about industrial design, the ethos of Cheyenne design and its connection to Bauhaus architecture <laughs> and their most recent machine offerings, including their latest machine, the Union, which I'm very, very impressed with. Chris had a lot to say about the subject and he's a great sport and we have a lot of fun whenever we chat. And this is no exception. So, enjoy. Mm. who you are and everything. For these guys, who are you? I'm Chris Akapi, Corporate Collaboration and Artist Manager for Cheyenne. Years back I was responsible also for quality management departments and also for product management. And you were a tattooist? Yeah, started tattooing. I'm just putting that in for everybody that goes, oh, those Cheyenne people, they're just engineers, they don't know anything about tattooing, they haven't got, even got a single tattooist working in the company. They've got at least one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, but it's, it's also a thing, right? It's one of those things where everybody likes to paint. I think sometimes like to paint the company as this kind of faceless corporate monster, you know, that doesn't have anything to do with tattooing and everything. And I'm like, I've met plenty of people in the tattoo world that work for Cheyenne that are really in the tattoo world. You Absolutely. Know? Um, <laughs> at least they are passionate about it. I wouldn't have met them if they weren't in the tattoo world. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> but when it comes to engineers, you want to get a car built by a race driver or by an engineer. Exactly. Your role at Cheyenne, is dealing with product development and artist relations, is that correct? Uh, not anymore with product development. It's like the, the link between the market and our design department, quality control, R&D, yeah. regulatory affairs, all that other topics. Yeah. So my, my job is basically like talking with people, networking, yeah. um, having great artists in our sponsored artist team. Yeah coordinate like our representation on conventions, stuff like that. So you're the guy that everybody should stop in conventions and nag to become a sponsored artist. Yeah, I love This that. is his face. Screen grab it and chase him around conventions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm going to refer to my notes that I want some things for, that I wanted to talk to Chris because we had some interesting conversations yesterday, actually. Cheyenne. Based in Berlin, now for me that's an important city because it's the home of my favourite uh, period of design. It's the home, or one of the homes of the Bauhaus because the, the Bauhaus was in a few places. It's certainly the home of the Bauhaus archive now. I, I know that most of you won't know the Bauhaus is an architecture museum, not a goth band from England. Uh, it's also a goth band from oh, oh, England. It's also a university. It yes. still operates in Weimar and Dessau. Oh, so wow. you can still, you can still um, go. study to, at the Bauhaus University. Yeah, that's incredible. So the Bauhaus had a, a huge influence on modern design, industrial design, with an ethos of simplicity. Making things as simple as possible and as elegant as possible without too many elaborations, you know, as a response to the kind of Gothic period that went before. And the reason I'm talking to you about that is I, I see that in all of designs that I see from Cheyenne. I can draw a direct line to it. Do you agree? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's really about design follows function. Yes. It's, you don't need like this fancy having like, okay, we also tried sometimes having some fancy features to getting yes. like new U, uh, USPs or- We'll get to them fancy getting, features in a minute. Getting um, <laughs> also younger generations attracted yep. to stuff like gesture control. But yeah, in the, in the end, it's really just like we, like in the old ways, it was mostly like considered the tattoo machine does have a soul and yeah. a lot of artists in the industry say, oh, this, a Cheyenne machine doesn't have any soul. No, it doesn't have to because it's a no. tool. But I would argue that they do, they have just have a different uh, representation of a soul. So what we're talking about is when you look at a Cheyenne machine, and I'll cut some pictures of them in, and you see these beautifully sleek machines with minimal function buttons on them, multi-function buttons that, that cover everything that we need to do. To me, this is a direct influence of somebody like Dieter Rams, who's a you know, famous German designer, as far as I know, he speaks German, so I presume he's German. Uh, worked for Braun famously, designed in, you know, like incredible pieces for Braun. I know this is a bit nerdy and designery, but I think if you look at uh, the Dieter Rams, the famous kind of bedside clock that he designed, and then look at your PU4, 
I think if you look at the PU4 and then you look at the clock, and I'll, I'll put a shot of the two of them up together, I, I, I think they're kind of kindred spirits, you know? And I do think that you look at that stuff and it, very, it does have a soul. There is, there's a function in it and a beauty in it that's not lots of bells and whistles and things hanging off it and charms and gems. It's, it's all about what it does. The geister, the main geister of yeah. our products, the secondary geister from short, the secondary geister from like uh, a little bit far away. And that leads automatically to how the power unit have to look like when it yeah. have to fit also the design of the machines. Yeah, and there's some beautiful solutions to like very, like quite complex problems of like how to stand the thing and multiple ways to oh, yeah. stand it, have it magnetically fit to things. And I, I think one of, because I mean, you know, I've used Shire machines pretty much um, since the beginning of my career. I started with coils and then my first uh, rotary machine was a Spirit and then I used them almost exclusively. And so I've always been in love with, with that stuff. There's some stuff that I think we encourage companies to try different things and go in different directions. But invariably, and I'm, I'm just as guilty of this as anybody because I've, I've been super vocal about how much I hate the, the, the gesture control in, in the Unlimiteds. And even though I, I dislike it, I've got to be honest, I love the fact that as a company, because it would be very easy for you to be a lot more conservative and go, do you know what, let's not do that, let's just put a couple of buttons on it, but then maybe I would have been sitting there going, oh man, just another machine with a couple of buttons, nothing yeah. interesting. You wouldn't be happy without being able to complain. <laughs> it's true, I'm a tattooist though. If that's the only problem you have with the machine. And realistically, yeah, that was the only thing. I don't like the way the control thing works. I like the, you know, everything else about it. You know, I just want you to build, like every tattooist I think in the world, I want you to build my machine for me. So I wanted to ask you with that. So you, you take a chance, um, it would have been a, a lot easier and probably a lot more expected for a, a bigger company, because Shine's a pretty big company, to take a much more conservative route, but you decided to go for it. Other than me, how was it? How has it been received as a as a control system for the machine? I, I presume it's kind of 50-50. People, I think it's one of those things people will either love it or completely not get it, like me. You know it. It's like the people who complain and are not happy, they are louder than the happy people. Of course we are. We're always louder. <laughs> so that's like not really balancing, but yeah. I think the numbers and how people like the machine, yeah. it's speaking for itself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that the most people really like it. Yeah. And But yeah, for some people, they would just prefer buttons. I mean, certainly for me, but I applaud the, the idea of trying new stuff because it would be really easy, given that, I've told you before, I think you've made at least two game-changing, iconic tattoo machines in the history of the company that I could genuinely look at and go, that has fundamentally changed the way the industry is and the way people think about how machines are designed. It would have been maybe a more obvious route to just live on past glories. So I, I applaud the fact that you go, Do you know what, let's just try something different. You know, maybe, you know, I mean, I like the fact that a company as big as Shine is still pushing. But getting tell, things right, getting things wrong, you know. T tell me well, one, maybe, tell maybe me one company who is living over over decades from their one-time glory. Yeah, exactly. You got to make the and next. You're done. Yeah, yeah, make the next game-changing machine. So I like that. So, am I right in thinking that the wireless machines are part of the Soul series? You know, yeah. So they, they fit under that umbrella. So there are two machines in that series that I love. So I love the Lunar and the Terra. To me, logical successors to kind of the feel of the spirit and the feel of the thunder. I think they're great machines. I love the, and I always get this term wrong, do you call it IntelliSense or, or IntelliDrive? No, it's a steady mode and responsive mode. Sorry, steady mode and responsive mode. So I really like the responsive mode on them. I think it's, it's a really good compromise for a kind of give feel. I'm excited to see where that goes. I'm sure you're working on developing that idea further. You know, like I run my Terra in the responsive mode all the time now because I find it more predictable for lining than the thunder was sometimes. Sometimes the thunder could be a little bit unpredictable because it just it's just straight and I think it's a great addition to them. I wasn't quite so keen on the, uh, only because of the control system, but you know, we've talked about that. But what I am excited about is the new machine, the Unio, is that correct? Is that yeah. correct? Like, so, uh, the name is Latin for union. Yeah, it's a synonym for it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, because this machine, quite excitingly, is 
three of your legendary machines, yeah. you know, the, the things that are different about them is the stroke length. And so now we've got an adjustable stroke Cheyenne machine. Yeah, from 2.5 stepless to 4 millimeters. So it unites the Spirit, Thunder, yeah. and also the Hawk Pen with the shape. And it's got a DC motor yes. rather than a brushless motor. So it, it feels incredibly powerful, which is something that I've got used to with the Cheyenne machines, you know, because the early machines were, were DC motors as well. And I like that feel of the machines but it's wired. Yeah. Is there a reason why we went, that went wired? Is that a technical thing? It's, it's both. The, a DC motor just have like, it needs really a lot of power. Yes. And adding a battery to that have also the problem that it would face like a lot of um, heaviness in the back. Yeah. Or you just have like, one and a half hours to tattoo and that's not satisfying and no. we don't we don't release products when we're not satisfied with no. the result. Now I found something out earlier that I thought was uh, fascinating so every because I'm going to get onto the length of time that you spend designing products but you told me earlier that you you target when you're designing the machines they they must all have three and a half thousand hours. Yeah exactly that's like 3520 hours that's yeah. Two years of warranty with 220 days a year working and eight hours. So that's so that's the mark. Every time we develop a product, yeah. a machine. So you aim for that benchmark. Yeah. So that's a pretty high benchmark to have to aim for to make a machine run constantly with no failures for two yeah. years and full time. I mean, that means when we're just changing a spring or one part, yeah. we have to set up around 100 of the prototypes working against fake skin just for one spring accelerated change. life cycle test. Yeah. Right. So just have it like, you can do that in a little bit. I think it's like three months that yeah. it takes to having 3,500 hours. And then if that spring doesn't yeah. make it, you got to do it again with another spring. Yeah, we, we built um, a test station for that to bring 100 machines in a position with 27 max, full needle depth yeah. and working against fake skin. I think it was the, the last time we spoke, you told me a really interesting story about a spring, about talking to a supplier that you were looking for a particular type of spring and there was only one company that you could find that would do it. And they presented you with the spring and it was like, we can make it, it's like, it's this big. And you went, yeah. no, we, we, we need it to be this big. And it was just an, an impossible thing yeah. to do. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, when you're thinking about like the idea process and then talking about the specifications and the market to yeah. find out what do artists really need. Then you're going to the design department, that already takes like a couple months. Right. But then, when you're coming to, to the purchasing department to find the, uh, the parts in a really good quality, that's like taking forever, especially when a pandemic came. Right. That like fucked up all the logistic <laughs> chains. <laughs> yeah. And we are just like there, okay, the, the product is ready to release, but what are we gonna do? Like yeah. releasing like thousands or 2,000 uh, pieces and then... Yeah, and, then and then nothing, yeah, right. It's gonna be like an iPhone launch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for seven people have got it and the rest of the world's waiting for one. So talking about that, we've seen, I think quite unusually, we've seen three machines in quite quick succession recently. Maybe you presume, maybe like I did, that these things maybe are done in, what, three or four months designed from conception to finished. You told me that there's a three-year process on some of these machines. So the three machines that have come out recently, I'm presuming they would have all been in the development stage uh, the year before the pandemic started and then they've just been sitting waiting during the kind of two years that the world was closed. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we've seen... I mean, that's that's like typical product management when yeah. you do that. It's it's a tool you use in, in every industry yeah. because you want to have like the right portfolio yeah. when you're ready with the product yeah. to fit the market in this time and not like releasing a product five years too late. The Umeo is out now. I've got to be honest, I love it. I think it's, I think, for, you know, because I haven't enjoyed the couple of wireless machines. For me, it's, um, it feels like a, a real return to, and I'm still shining there's a lot of things to a lot of different people, but for me, they're the machines that I've thrown in rock sacks and dragged around the world for 10 years all the time, knowing, do you know what, as long as I've got a spirit and a thunder in my bag, I'll be okay. I actually think you might have just retired those two machines for me. I think I might just be carrying maybe two of the unios and just one in a spare, you know? Yeah. I've been really pleasantly surprised with it. And I think, other than, it gave me a little bit of a headache initially barriering it, you know, like, cause you've got to figure out, cause it's got, you know, if you've not seen it yet, it's got the adjustment for the stroke is on the top, and then you've obviously got the adjustable grip at the bottom. But once I'd kind of 
figured out, okay, I'm, how am I gonna kind of cope with with this? Actually, it's a really nice, comfortable machine to work. I mean, it's, it's with every machine. When you're switching machines, you just have to get used to it because yeah, it exactly, right? also depends on your hand speed, hand pressure. And it's also not like you cannot tell it after one tattoo because maybe it's Do also- Do you know one of my favorite skin. features of it that I thought was, I don't, I mean, I'm sure it was deliberate. I thought, man, I'm gonna put this thing down on the counter and it's just gonna roll off. Right, but where the adjustment is, there's a little there's a little piece that sticks out that stops it from rolling, and I, it, I kind of rolled it expecting it to roll, and then realised it was there, and was like, I wonder how long that took to figure out, you know? That, well, basically we had that because um... it's another piece fitted in, isn't it? It's a milled piece that's, or is is that no, milled? It's, that's milled as one thing. The, it's part of the end piece. Yeah. But we figured that out when we came up with the hawk pen. Yeah. Looking from the outside to that, having like a room with 10 people yeah. rolling machines for a couple of hours <laughs> and thinking about that and yeah. remodeling stuff and yeah. rolling it again. And Did anybody suggest a hexagonal machine? Yeah, but we want to have it like really clean as possible. I'd like to see a hexagonal machine. I think that would be comfortable. You know, like if it was a hexagon, it'd be fucking cool. Why are you laughing at me? Why have somebody built one that I don't know about? What's wrong with a hexagonal tattoo machine? It'd be cool. <laughs> fucking Chris giving me a hard time behind the camera, fuck him. We were talking about machines. Uh, we haven't talked about power supplies. So there's a couple of power supplies that have come out, the PU4 and presumably the 5, right? Is that how they work? No, PU4 and PU3, they are on the market at the yeah. moment. One is gesture control. That's the PU3, right? yeah. That's the PU3. And the 4 is the one that I've got sitting back there, which I, as a, a, a little piece of design, I think it would, I think you could put that in a little design museum. I think it's just a great bit of kit. So I need to see the other one and see what you did with that one. Well, I've seen some stuff that you showed me the last time we were talking about the amount of iterations. Because obviously we get these things and we just pick them up and go, oh yeah, that works, it's obvious. Yeah. But sometimes it working and being obvious, somebody has to figure that stuff out. With the little one that I'm, I'm talking about, how? How many iterations of that design? I saw a version of it that you were working on that had like legs on it that kind of slid down. I think I said to you at the time, I bet the production department weren't particularly happy about that, but I think that the solution's awesome. I can't count the iterations. <laughs> it's just like, um, only when you look at the, at the pictures with all the yeah. little post-its, because, I mean, we can, we can show that. All of that post-its there are hand scribbled. Yeah. It's all post-its our design department made, and. The whole office was like covered with that and they were just like, okay, but uh, as, as a person who never studied product design, you're yeah, standing yeah. there like, what does this mean? What is that? It's like some weird mind map yeah. of where they're gonna go, you know. But then it's of course our product, uh, our product design department is really helpful on that. Yeah. And they're guiding idiots like, coming from engineers. Yeah, or, yeah. Because they're, they, they know about the aesthetics and also they have the design background. Yeah. And I mean, our design department is like. Whose job is it to design? Is to balance the the form and the function, you know, and, and make things that are aesthetically beautiful but also incredibly functional. Who, who they got? You got a lead designer that's in charge of making sure that this is in the Cheyenne ethos, you know, and all that. Yeah. Or is it just a general like the company? You know, if you work there, maybe you feel that way. I don't know. No, it's it's like a, a mindset we all have, and when we are not sure. Because in the end, the product manager has to make the decision. Yeah. But if the product manager isn't sure, we have a, a lot of artists in our tester pool and also sponsored artists, and we can just ask them. And then we're getting directly the market feedback because as you said earlier, it's like no tattoo artists are developing the machines, they're engineers. Yeah. And then you need the market feedback, which leads us also to that, that there is no, no, ego, um, no egoistic perspective on that. Yeah. Because it's really, the product isn't the focus. Yeah, the product and is the, product for the, is the focus. For, yeah. the, for the product, yeah. you need a market. So it's it's made for artists. It is. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. You, know, you are your catchphrase. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got a three year lead time, you've, you, you must already be working on new stuff. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so you've got new stuff coming. Is there anything that you can tell us about the no. new stuff? No, not at all. <laughs> Chris, get the gaffer tape. No. <laughs> we'll beat it out of him. Uh, Could I get invited for dinner first because you do, before you do stuff like that? <laughs> <laughs> Normally, you know, you're in England oh, now. I, I got pizza yesterday. Yeah, you got pizza. I bought you dinner. That's so. True. <laughs> so there's nothing you can tell us about. Um, Are there things that you're excited about? 
is this stuff that you're sitting on and going, I can't wait to be able to tell people about this stuff? Absolutely, or is it all the time. So this, this never ends, you know, there's always something new coming through. Yeah, I mean, we also, when we're having like new machines, we have machines yeah. sitting in our R&D where every tattoo artist would say, oh, I would love to have this machine. Yeah. But then we sometimes come to a point, we don't have a solution for that product yet. We're not satisfied with the with performance of it. Yeah, yeah. Even when we think about it, it's like, it would be a great product, yeah. But it's like the last 5% are still missing. And then we don't release products like that. I think that's really interesting that you don't get to the 95%. I mean, I've used countless products over the years, not just in tattooing, that are 90% there, you know what I mean? And you go, oh man, if, it just, if they'd just spent an extra month on it or something, we could have been. Those weird little niggles become, you know, if you use a product every single day, that those weird little things that drive you crazy that are like that. I'd like to see you make an inherently left-handed machine. I'm telling you, on the show, there's a lot of left-handers. By the way, if it also, with the, with the Solnova Unlimited, with the flyer we have there that explain it for the first time you're using it, you can turn it around and there's like for left-hand people. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I like that. I did like, I, I did like that, you know, that it was a double-sided poster that would make sense. To be fair, a lot of artists are like, how is that in that work? It's like, there's a manual. And yeah. they're like, there was a manual and I was like, we're a German company, we have so many regulations, the book is that thing, I mean, the manual, and you haven't seen the, it. The, the manual that it. comes with every machine is like a small Bible. Yeah. You know, mine's, uh, like probably every tattooist that's watching this, mine is still in the box. I've never even touched it. I literally opened the box, took the carry case out, took the machine out, put it all back in the box and threw it in the back of the office and just plugged the machine in. Yeah. Didn't read a single thing and went, how does this work? if the machines invite just using them. My argument's always been if I can just use it without reading the manual, then it must be pretty well designed. And most of them, you can kind of figure it out from how they look, you know what I mean? You just go, well, that's got to be the obvious way of doing it, you know. The only other subject that I really wanted to touch on, we were talking about 3,520 hours, two years of runtime. I think most people, myself included, would, would tell you that the Cheyenne machines will easily run for five years. No problem. I've got a 12, I think it's 12 years old this year, my spirit, and it still runs. Um, it's noisy as hell, but it's, it still works, right? I've flown all over the world with two Cheyenne machines in the back. And like, if they ever fuck up, I'm screwed, right? And they never did. Now that level of reliability comes at a cost, right? Yeah. Because you can't get that, that kind of industrial design by, by people who will have completely understood the first 10 minutes of the stuff that I was talking to you about because that's the world they live in. That doesn't come cheap, yeah. right? Reliability doesn't come cheaply. To have that level of reliability uh, and trustworthiness is part of the inherent cost of the machines, right? Absolutely, I mean, the quality control is a, is a huge step. Yeah. And also like incoming parts that we can't produce in-house. Yeah. We have to test them. Sometimes it's a 3D scan for some parts and they're yeah, yeah. also expensive. Yeah, that stuff doesn't happen and then overnight. Even, even then, when you have like several steps of quality control, yeah. by statistic, you still have bad on arrival machines. Because that's statistics. It's, yeah, it's just that, that was just You happen, cannot yeah. do that. It's because it's like to fix all of that, yeah. that would be increasing the costs yeah. enormous. I've had one failure in um, in 10 years of all the Cheyenne products that I've used, you know, and that was in needle cartridge and membrane, split a membrane, you know, it's just a, it's just a bad membrane, right? And that's my machine. I've never had a Cheyenne machine go down, you know, which is why I carried them everywhere. Even when I was favoring a, another brand of machines, like, because I know that they'll always work. You know, we're getting into an era now where you know, machines are getting into, you know, over the thousand pound mark on machines. Do you see that continuing? Or are we going to hit? A, you know, do you think there's going to be a glass ceiling when we get to? It? Like I get it with the with the wireless machines because you're effectively buying a power supply and a tattoo machine in one. So if you price up a tattoo machine and a and a power supply, they kind of combine into that. I mean, you could also go 60 years ago and asking a person, do you think cars will ever cost more than two thousand five hundred dollars? Yeah, for sure, because we might not have thought anybody would pay a quarter of a million pound for a car in the future, right? We just don't know. Uh, do hopefully we? we don't have to. <laughs> Can you imagine? There's an inherent cost. You know, if you want that kind of reliability, if you want that kind of design, then you have to be prepared to, to pay for that, the, the level of effort that's gone into that. 
But I also like the fact that, and I was talking to somebody about this recently at a convention. Somebody asked me what machine I thought they should buy. You know, they're early in their career. And I said, buy the old Spirit and the old Thunder. 10 years ago, these were world-class tattoo machines. As far as I'm concerned, they still are. I mean, the world of tattoo machines has moved on, but you can still easily do world-class tattoo, tattoos with that. And they're incredibly affordable. You know, so there's, uh, they've almost become almost like an entry level machine, you know, like you can buy the pair of them for like not a huge amount of money. Yeah, because everybody is still asking us, please never cancel the Spirit of the Thunder. All my apprentices work with that machine. Oh, absolutely. All, you know, all of my apprentices have started on a Spirit and a Thunder. Every single one of them. You know, I gave them, there's your Spirit, there's your Thunder, start there, and then we'll figure it out from there, you know, and if you change your machines later on. Yeah, and even, even with like rising costs that we have, we all feel at it, like rising costs everywhere. Yeah. We constantly try to improve our processes, to cut down yeah. prices there in the process. I mean, the, the other thing I say to people, I can, go, I can go out and buy a machine from Amazon, uh, mass-produced, cheap machine that's got similar features to some of the latest machines. It's going to cost me maybe a couple of hundred pounds. I'll be lucky if it lasts maybe a year, you know. And then I think about it and I go, okay, so if I went and bought the Cheyenne, That'll, that'll run for 10 years. Actually. Also, what I would say is like, you can also do that at home, like just having a thin paper over, um, over fake skin and then using a Cheyenne machine compared yeah. to, a, to a cheaper one. Yeah. And then just, just have a look on the, the hits of the dots. Yeah. And the distance between the, continu how yeah. continuously it is. Yeah. That's, I mean, you will be surprised that there is a difference. Yeah, because there's, there's movement, you know. And I think it's a false economy to buy, you know, you can buy 10 cheap machines. And okay, maybe it's a little bit cheaper, but if you get one really good machine, then the quality of your work is much better because the quality of your tool is much better throughout. You know, you've just got that upfront cost. But actually it's, it's no more expensive than buying a series of cheap machines that could fail, you know, and won't yield a quality result, you know. Talk with any craftsman and ask them, are you going for the, for the 10 cheap, Tools, or you're getting the one proper one, and all of them are like, I'm just get getting the, the proper get one. Get the one proper one for good, yeah, you know. I, I, pr I completely appreciate that. There's lots of cheap guitars lying around, you know, but I'd much rather play a 3,000 pound guitar than a 30 pound guitar. Yeah. Well, and I think that's us then. Thanks for joining me, Chris. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah. This is Chris from Cheyenne. We'll ask you more questions. Stick it in the comments down below. And uh, if I didn't ask him a question that you want, me to ask him, I'll, I can message him and we'll get your answers in the comments. Just ask your comments down below. Don't forget to follow Cheyenne on YouTube for their, their latest nudes from their products. Mm.